Fine Ludin, and I'm a legal advisor at uh, the Swedish Post and Telecom Authority. I, uh, looking through the other speakers' bio bios, I um, discovered that mine was quite short. So I may add that um, I have spent many years working uh, for a law firm here in Stockholm. I also spent a year in southern Japan, and I would like a puppy. So that's that's basically it for me. And uh, moving on to this presentation. Um, now I work at the network security department at PTS, and we have recently issued a new regulation on security measures to be taken by any provider of networks and services uh, on the Swedish telecom market. And they uh, concern operational reliability, so making sure that stuff functions function. And just to start with a bit of a background, we've actually had a recommendation in place since 2007, um, but as uh, the name of it suggests, it's a non-binding document and um, um, it mostly uh, included provisions relating to risk assessment and risk management. And uh, so why, you might ask, would PTS see a new for stricter regulation? Because the new regulation is binding. Uh, what has happened since 2007? Uh, well, quite a lot I would say, but uh, for us it's these three uh, factors. First of all, society is increasingly dependent on functioning other functioning services. And we can also see that the number of users are still increasing, it's, is still increasing in Sweden. Uh, and also we can see that the number of significant interruptions is not decreasing. Providers of service, uh, of uh, electronic communication services and networks are, are obliged by uh, law and regulation to report any interruption of significant impact to PTS. And so we can see through the reporting that um, the number is not increasing. We have a constant figure of, of around 50 incidents per year, uh, which is quite high, we think. So together, this calls for, 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 for a strict regulation. Um, in Sweden, we can see this is actually for 2015 mainly, but we can see three main causes of incidents. First, uh, every year or every other year, we have storms here, which uh, will cause power outages, and that in turn will affect the telecommunications sector as well. Uh, so that's a big cause for incidents here, as well as cable cuts and human errors or, or faults relating to change management and configuration. So here are some of the um, uh, things that we would like to fix with the new regulation. Uh, so the scope of the regulation is requirements concerning the technical and organizational measures that network and service providers shall take. And this comes from, this is not something that we ourselves made up, it comes from EU regulation, and it's been, uh, it's also in the Swedish Electronic Communications Act. And it says that you should take these technical and organizational measures to ensure a reasonable level of operational reliability. So, so it's the minimum level of operational reliability. And um, the provision may be divided into three different categories. Um, first, we have general provisions for all providers. So all providers of networks and services, including, for instance, dark fiber providers or network owners. Uh, we have, secondly, provisions for providers who know how many um, uses that would be affected if a certain asset would fail to function. So here we have, for instance, not dark fiber providers, but instead service providers and uh, communications operators, for instance. Thirdly, we have one provision for mobile network and service providers. And uh, the second category that includes uh, provisions relating to redundancy and backup power. And the third one is for backup power and coverage. And the first one, uh, those are quite more general as the name suggests. First we have a, a requirement that every provider must have a security organization. Uh, they must work long term, systematically. And, uh, and continuously with security issues. They must have pre-established roles, someone in charge of security issues. 
and uh, they must also document all their processes, all their tests, etc. Every provider must also document all their assets and all connections to and also know what they do and where they are, etc. And then for all those documented assets and connections, every provider must carry out risk and impact analysis. And there are also th certain um, threats that must always be uh, considered when, when carrying out the risk assessment. I'll come back to that later, but there are certain requirements um, for the risk assessment. Uh, every provider must also have a process for incident management, business continuity planning, and there are also provisions relating to access and authorization, making sure that only those who really need to get access to a certain asset uh, is granted it, etc. And there are uh, also a provision relating to surveillance and preparedness, which means that you must at all times surveil your networks, active parts of your networks, and uh, you must also at all times have people standing by to act if there's an alarm. And then lastly, we have some requirements um, that has to do with your risk assessment, as I said before. There are certain um, threats that must always be analyzed in your risk assessments, and you must also always take such measures to, to um, protect your assets and connections. And that, that has to do with uh, physical and logical intrusion and other external impact, weather-related threats, and then threats related to plan changes. So before any major uh, change to your network or service, you must carry out tests and also draft a risk duration plan or a rollback plan. And then we also have this final uh, extra provision saying that when you carry out your risk analysis and you see that you have a certain risk or a threat, uh, you should also take measures to protect yourself from that threat, any additional threat. So. Moving on to the second category, as you might recall, these were the first, the first category were for all providers. Uh, these are only for those who are aware of the number of users, okay? And the first thing that they should do is classify their assets in terms of how many users or active access points that would be affected if uh, that asset failed to function. So, if you have more than 200 thousand people that would be affected if a certain asset would fail, that would be a class A asset. Uh, and a class A asset could be a media gateway or uh, an HLR, for instance, whilst a, a class D could be a switch or a router or a large base station, for instance. So we don't really tell the providers how to do this classification other than this. So you, you yourself have to decide where to put your assets. So this is the first thing you do. You classify your asset, and that's also part of your documentation requirement that, you had, that I had before, that every asset and every connection needs to be documented. That documentation needs also to include a reference to which class that each asset belongs to. All right, and the, the higher the class, the tougher the requirement. So here are some uh, two important definitions, just to, to, to understand what I'm talking about a bit more. An asset that's a function consisting of a delimited part of a communications network or a communication service, which is necessary to provide such a network or service, and which is used to transmit, receive, process or store information. So it's an active part of your network or, or uh, service. And it cannot be the whole network, and it cannot be the whole service, because it's a delimited part, and it cannot be the smallest of things either, because it needs to be something that's necessary for the provision of the service or the network. And active access point, I am simplifying it by calling it users, but it's, uh, it, it means a point of access to a communications network or communications service that allows immediate use of communications services. Um, so the, the category two provisions relate to redundancy and backup power. I'm going to go through them real quickly. 
First, we have redundancy of assets, which means that the provider shall, through redundant asset, ensure that assets in classes A and B, which cease the function, do not cause any disturbance or interruptions to the service. Uh, for class C, it's enough to have, uh, you could either have a redundant asset or you could have a critical part of the asset redundant. So if it's a critical card in a specific uh, asset, uh, then you just multiply that one. For class D, you could either have the, the critical components redundant or you can have um, spare parts nearby and people who go and fix the problem after it happens. And you have 12 hours to fix it if it's a weekday and 18 hours at other times. We also have some requirements as regard redundancy of connections. Whereas uh, you must have redundant connections between all assets within and between the classes A, B, and C. And for A and B, those connections must also be separated, separated uh, geographically. Connections between, uh, for, for D, again, there's a possibility to, to fix the problem after it happens if you have, you have 12 hours to fix it normally and 18 hour, hour, hours if it's uh, not on a weekday. And then we have the backup power requirement, whereas uh, the provider shall, with backup power system, ensure 24 hours of backup power for assets in classes A and B, and eight hours for class C, if it's in an urban area, which is more than 8,000 people, 12 hours for assets if it's in rural areas, two hours for class D in urban areas, and four, other, four hours in, uh, at uh, other places. Um, very popular requirement, this. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, people or uh, providers, when we were drafting this regulation, were, were particularly upset with the four hour for class D. That's something that they, they normally didn't have at the time. Uh, but we have seen that uh, through uh, statistics and from the power sector, we can see that 80% of all the power outages in these areas would be uh, uh, would be handled through a four-hour backup power. So that's why we, we put the four-hour there. It's, uh, that's the reason. You should also have. There are also requirements regarding testing of backup power systems and processes for handling the, the backup <coughs> systems. So the third category was for uh, mobile service and network providers. And uh, they um, shall ensure that uh, regardless of the, the, the backup power requirements that I just mentioned for, for category two, they should, regardless of the, the size of the asset, they must ensure that the service is maintained if there's a power outage for one hour in cities and also maintain the coverage and four hours in other areas. And in order to do this, sometimes they are also allowed to reduce the number of frequencies used in order to save power. And if the remaining capacity then is not enough to, to um, uphold all these services, the provider shall firstly uh, maintain um, voice services, secondly messaging services, and thirdly data communication services. And this is quite controversial. I think that we, 2016, still believe that um, voice services should be uh, maintained. But uh, we're quite aware that this might change in the future, but we have uh, discussed this for, for many hours within PTS and, and decided that still 2016 we think the most important service is voice. Okay, and also these requirements are quite costly for many of the providers, so we have also, and not only that, they could sometimes be inappropriate, the measures that we've uh, stated, which have led us also to include a provision uh, that says that PTS may grant exemption from redundancy and backup power requirements if the measure itself is inappropriate in relation to the positive impact, if other regulation prevents the measures or the measure, 
or if uh, the measure is inappropriate in relation to it, it's uh, it, in relation to that is concerns an asset or connection that will be removed within short. Uh, but there are some uh, instructions on the PTS website on how to to receive such an exemption. It's not just to to look. we we assess whether or not a provider should be granted uh, an exemption. Uh, and in any case, the provider must also take alternative measures to limit the effect of the prescribed measure not being taken. And the regulation uh, actually enters into force uh, on different times depending on which requirement we're talking about. When it, when it comes to the backup power and redundancy requirements, they enter into force on June 10, 2020 unless you make any alteration to a, an asset and backup power system, because as soon as you make any changes to it, the, the requirements start to, uh, to apply immediately. And also for the Category 1 requirements, the, one that I, the ones that I started with, the uh, risk analysis, the business continuity planning and all that, they've already entered into force. So we're actually starting already to supervise these requirements. Uh, and the actual regulation may be found at ETS.SC. It's been translated also into English. And you can also find our plan for upcoming supervision of this regulation, because it's, it's already started. Just briefly going to mention that we also have a similar uh, regulation in place already on uh, security measures to be taken in order to protect data that's being processed, um, and we're already carrying out supervision as regard this regulation as well. And that's it for me. Um, are there any questions, uh, apart from did I get Scott Adams' approval for this? No, I didn't, so it's for private use. Um, any questions that you might have, please send them to me. There's my email address and uh, as I said the regulation is already in place and many of the provisions are, 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 are uh, already um, in effect so yeah thank you Great. Price increase for end users when this is implemented. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, we this regulation uh, we started to work on it. I think it was 2012, so it took us a few years to complete it. And uh, we have, of course, been uh, having a dialogue with all, all with all most providers and the big providers and uh, asked them about these kind of questions. So we've uh, collected a lot of data and a lot of costs for each and every um, um, requirement. And we haven't really done that sort of detailed uh, uh, analysis of the, the actual increase. They have said that uh, this will probably lead to, to um, an increase in consumer prices, but we haven't seen that so far at least. So. Um, I, I don't have a figure. No, I don't. But um, the actual co the total cost for the whole regulation was estimated to around one billion Swedish crowns from PDS at least, and from the providers, I think it was the double. But we also based our calculations on information received from the providers. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Here we go. Really, um, the cost for the consumer here, isn't that quite important? Isn't the, just keeping the Swedish infrastructure working through power cuts, isn't that the prime directive here? Uh, I think this is much more important than if 
the cost of a telephone call goes up to 20 euro per minute or something. This is much more. <coughs> Sweden haven't had a crisis for such a long time. We, we have never been in war. We have never been occupied or anything. We don't know what a crisis is. You guys have to think about the crisis. We have no idea. So, you know, 20 euro on a telephone call, isn't that quite unimportant? Yeah, I agree. Uh, at the same time, this is only the minimum level of security, uh, the ground level. So, providers in many cases already have uh, most of this in place. For instance, if we say 24 hours of backup power for classes A and B, in many cases they have 48 hours. So, this is the minimum level. So. Um, that's also one thing to, 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 to bear in mind when you look at the costs for it. It's, it's additional costs, of course, it's not starting from nothing. And uh, providers in Sweden are, are, are generally uh, good when it comes to working with operational liabilities. So, yeah. All right, my last question. Yes. I mean, imagine what would happen if Sweden is cut in two. This has happened on the... On the electrical backbone ones, and Sweden was cut in two, just south of Mera, or, or south of Vetter, I think. There, there was a large power outage. <coughs> the, the net node NTP project has, has taken care of this. Sweden will continue to get accurate, traceable time, even if Sweden is cut in two hospitals. But what will happen to the mobile networks, for example? The Sunet network is safe, as far as I understand. But what will, what will happen to the mobile phone connections if Sweden is cut in two? Has anyone been thinking about this? One day it will, I promise you. Okay. Well, with that, thank you very much, Karen.